I'm uh, delighted to introduce uh, Professor Jay Gao, who's at the University of Michigan in the departments of electrical engineering and computer science, applied physics, mechanical engineering, and macromolecular science and engineering. He works on photovoltaics and photodetectors, flexible transparent conductors, photonic devices and sensors, and nanoimprint roll-to-roll nano manufacturing. He's an editor at Optica and IEEE uh, Journal of Photovoltaics. Uh, he's won uh, many awards, including Research Excellence Award uh, from the Engineering School at Michigan. And something he may not know was he was one of the first people mentioned when we put ACS Nano together. One of our original associate editors, uh, Grant Wilson, pointed me uh, to his work and told me to pay attention to it. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Gao for his ICANX talk. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for the kind introduction. You can see the screen well, right? Yes. All right, okay. Yeah, thank you, Alice and Paul, for the uh, invitation to speak on this open platform to connect with the world. Um, the, uh, I also want to uh, take this opportunity to thank many students uh, who have done outstanding contribution to the work that I will describe. And you can see from this list of names, uh, most of them have the Asian <laughs> names. Yeah. In two weeks, it will be the Lunar New Year that's celebrated by the uh, many nation, uh, Asian countries. So this is a good opportunity for me to for dedication to them. Yeah. And many of them actually working as uh, professors in China or in Korea. Yeah. For those in, working academics, I'll show pictures of them <coughs> because they're in the uh, uh, public domain. Yeah. Um, <coughs> this topic, uh, the, uh, the title, right? Uh, would like to do more. It's really um, due to a lack of a better name because I want to describe several different topics, uh, but I found that the light is a common thread that I could use. And so that's why I chose this. And also a uh, disclaimer uh, in the beginning. So I and a couple of students, uh, we do have a um, uh, financial interest in some of the technologies. All right, now, Let's take a look at this question, what light can do for us. Like any researchers, we start with literature search. Now, okay. now according to this, uh, perhaps the most widely cited references, light is the second, create, uh, second invention of God after creation of heaven and earth. So it gotta be really important. In, as a matter of fact, without light, we won't be here. So perhaps the most amazing manufacturing processes enabled by light is the photosynthesis. It takes simple molecules, water, and carbon dioxide, and turn into chemical fuel and oxygen that we all the lives basically live on. Now, light is also behind many modern technologies. The fact that I can talk to Paul in LA and Alice in Beijing in a fashion that you don't see a noticeable delay, right? This is, in fact, have to think light. Is the optical communication, is the invention of fibers, lasers, and many optical electronic devices that make this possible. Now we have tens of thousands of audience online listening to these talks. And they look, they use their pad or phones, right? And they have to have very powerful chips, microprocessors. Oh handle this information. Now, <clears throat> Professor, um, uh, Professor Huang mentioned the pattern right, using this uh, interesting printing technique for making patterns. If you only have a piece of uh, silicon or any other material, it's not that useful. It is how you can position and put them into functional units that makes them useful. Right? In make for microchips, light is also very, very important. It is a process that's called uh, photolithography that is used over and over again. It accounts for approximately 30% of the entire manufacturing process. And it's, it's amazing that engineers can develop technologies and machinery to pattern structures down to nanometer dimension at industrial scale. 
And this, in my view, is the true nanotechnology that uh, really transformed, uh, transformed the world. Okay. Now, on the lighter side, the light can also enable us to see our beautiful world around us, okay? uh, be it on the left, be it natural or man-made. On the left, these uh, colors, in fact, that we see, right, are co coming from so-called pigment, colored pigments. For example, they can be organic dyes or inorganic pigments. Okay. And we like to color everything around us. Right? So every single day, we use tons of these pigments in order to do this purpose. Now, uh, some of these dyes, especially organic dyes, we know they can fade under UV light. Right? They can be degraded by heat and they cannot stand the chemicals. And the colors are also somewhat limited because it's designed by nature. It de it's determined by the specific molecular structure. Okay? Yeah. You cannot just take any material and give right to the color you want. On the right-hand side is interesting. These are from uh, nature, right? Potatoes, uh, fruit, and fish. They also give out pretty brilliant colors. And very interestingly, a lot of these species, right, they don't have actually colored pigments in them. Um, it's actually due to the structure. One very well-known example is this morpho blue uh, butterfly. And they've all this brilliant blue color. And you actually magnify the, the wing, for example, you see this very ordered submicron structure. Okay? And it doesn't actually have any colored pigment. Is the light scattered off by these structures, and if they interfere constructively, okay, in the wavelengths of blue, they give rise to this blue um, color. It's a very interesting effect. Yeah, and now perhaps this morpho butterfly uh, among the uh, the insects is, is very famous. Yeah, once it become famous, uh, and sometimes money comes. Okay, so in fact, you can spend over three hundred dollars uh, from this website. You can get seven of these dried uh, morpho blue uh, butterfly samples. Very beautiful, okay? Now, <clears throat> so there, this um, leads to this concept, so-called structural color, okay? By that, what I mean is that you don't have to require a specific material. It's how you structure it, how this structure interacts with light that give rise to a particular color or any color that you like to have. So I'll give you a couple of examples to start with. So here, uh, this is a work that we've done uh, many years ago. Uh, imagine that was done during you know, the game of uh, Olympic games. So these five Olympic rings of different shapes, uh, different, uh, different colors, they're actually uh, very tiny. You can see that uh, scale up, uh, you know, blow up, it's, uh, it's a two micron bar. How these colors are produced? Yeah. This is, a, you can imagine, it's made on a silicon chip, right? So there's, it's very difficult to produce colored pigments down to uh, tens of nanometers. So the way to do it is, uh, is actually quite simple. So you take a piece of glass on the lower left, right? you basically etch these nanoscale walls into the glass, right? And then you just coat everything with a metal, in this case, silver layer. So the light comes from the, the, the backside. Yeah, this is a reflecting color. So whatever the wavelengths of light, that fit in this nano cavity, all right? That can create a resonance and eventually get absorbed. And so the color you see is the complementary to the wavelengths that actually trap in this cavity. So this may sound a little fancy, but I can give you a, a you know, data example that many people are familiar with. For example, if you play an instrument like the flute, the Chinese flute, yeah, you put your fingers at certain positions that give, give rise to different sounds. It is exactly the same principle. So your finger position actually determines this acoustic cavity length. Okay. We know the acoustic wavelength is you know, on the order of tens or hundreds of centimeters. Right? But the same effect, optical wavelength is about a million times smaller. So if you reduce that effect a million times, then you get this. So it's a very similar. Now, of course, uh, you can imagine these uh, uh, just uh, very colored pictures are very tiny, right? I mean, these are uh, the horizontal lens is probably 20 micron. So you can fit multiple of this onto a single pixel on your phone, very tiny. And there are other uh, properties. 
uh, for example, this deal with some plasmonic effect. So it's actually sensitive to polarize the light uh, polarization direction. So for instance, if you would one polarization, you can see the image, but if you actually rotate the polarization 90 degrees, the image disappears, you couldn't see it. So these features could be used, for example, for anti-counterfeit, a very simple way to differentiate. And it's very difficult to make because they're <laughs> very tiny. Now, this is a, a reflection type. And the earlier work that we did is actually a transmission type. It's showing in, uh, in this slide. So in the middle, that's the structure. <clears throat> it's very simple again. It takes what? A metal dielectric metal, and two metal layers sandwiching a dielectric layer. Now, if you don't do anything, it's simply a mirror. You know, in this case, uh, I think we use aluminum. So it's actually reflecting very well. But once you cut these nanoscale grooves into this step, right, become this nano grating, right, then it can actually transmit any desired color you want, just simply by controlling the pitch of the pattern. So on the lower left, you can see these different color pixels that are coming out from the structure. And they give actually pretty high efficiency, 80%. You know. um, the, uh, on, the, on the left, this, uh, on the upper left, this uh, <clears throat> U of M logo colored. I can safely say this is, this is likely the smallest colored logo uh, of, uh, in the university because you have to use uh, look under microscope in order to see it. <clears throat> this again uh, utilize a surf, uh, you know, uh, electromagnetic wave that's propagating uh, between the metal and dielectric surface, the so-called surface plasma, and it's using a two surface wave. The coupling of that give rise the hybridized mold, you know, very much like uh, you know, how molecules form bonding and antibonding orbitals. Yeah. And you can select one of the mold by using this. Um, um, grading structure, you can scatter into them and scatter out. That's a, simply put it, that's a physics. And <clears throat> these structures, again, are pretty tiny, right? The period range from uh, you know, a couple hundred to three, 300, depending on the wavelength. The total thickness is actually very small. These are one or two orders of magnitude smaller than what you would do with typical colored pigments. Okay. So at that time, uh, this will generate some interest because it, um, it again, transmit polarized light, okay? And simply just by patterning. Right? Now, uh, it's very compatible with actually LCD, liquid crystal display. Yeah, so the, the, the later <clears throat> we actually got a, a sponsored product from a company to look into this. Now here, you can see the structure that I mentioned in the previously, and this one <clears throat> requires not very tiny, you know, the structure not as small as uh, what you see on the microchip, but they're small enough that's difficult to do in the university lab, right? By using, a, like I say, a contact aligner, lithography too, okay? And certainly for this, you don't want to use the industrial uh, UV lithography stepper tool. That's way too expensive for this. Yeah. So we have to come up with a, <clears throat> a good strategy that's suitable for this type of structure and cost effective, yes, cost effective, right? And so, oh, I should, uh, I want to thank a number of students. This is the work of an uh, 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 exchange a PhD student in my lab at the time, Xu uh, Ping Xu, yeah, who is uh, now a uh, professor in the uh, Nanjing University. He has done uh, many more interesting photonic, nanophotonic work. <clears throat> so the strategy we use is a simple mechanical um, uh, printing technique, a nano imprint. Uh, it's an analogy of how you make cookies out of a mold. But in this case, the mold basically is uh, shrink down to nanoscale dimensions. But otherwise, it's very similar. You can take any plastic, right? Uh, uh, thermal plastic, for example, you heat it up above its glass transition temperature when it's soft and you can emboss your pattern into it. This is entirely conformal as long as you will actually uh, be able to make your mold, you can potentially replicate it. Yeah. Imprinting is, is very easy. You can push into any material. You can use UV curable material, and that's where you use light to, uh, to cure it. Yeah. But the problem, challenge comes from the separation. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, this top uh, figure is the, uh, what you ideal, ideally what you want to get. But if the material is not strong enough, they can break, right? uh, create defects. 
or the adhesion too strong to the mold because you can imagine the surface area is huge, right? uh, but not enough adhesion to the substrate, you can entirely take off the whole film. That's also a failure. So, but fortunately over the past, I would say a couple of decades, uh, through the effort of many researchers throughout the world, uh, most of these problems have been solved. And this technology have moved down to uh, industrial scale. Okay. Now I'll just give you an example from my own laboratory. Um, <clears throat> this is the work of a, a former student. You can see that he made a very special mold. Okay, it's only 20 nanometer gap, um, uh, you know, almost 200 nanometer tall uh, by atomic layer deposition. And he used this mold to imprint into a polymeric film, a specially designed polymeric film, because typical mo mo molecule will not be able to stand this. And you can get it's nine to one, very high aspect ratio. <clears throat> okay. Now with this, <clears throat> the, um, uh, uh, so we can actually make those type of structures. Another um, application of this technology uh, back then was to make a metal wire grid. Okay. Why do we want to do that? Because we want to make metal to be transparent or at least to be semi-transparent. Uh, why is that? Because metal is ductile, right? So it's uh, you can bend it without breaking. Yeah. If you make it into this metal grid or mesh structure, it's even more flexible. Yeah. That's along the same line as what Professor Huang just described. Try to come up with a flexible uh, transparent electrode. Yeah. Transparent electrode is extremely useful for light emitting devices, for solar cells, touch panels, you name it. Right? Anywhere you actually need the light to go in and out, you need it. <clears throat> Traditionally, people have been using uh, a material called ITO, indium tin oxide. It's a conducting oxide material. So um, <clears throat> back in 2007, we actually did a first demonstration, okay, making a metal grid by using nano imprint. Uh, we made, uh, <clears throat> in this case, uh, LED, light emitting, organic light emitting device out of this uh, uh, structure. And later on, uh, we moved on to making organic photovoltaic. Uh, so comparing the devices, let's say made on ITO versus this semi-transparent uh, metal grid made out of gold or any other metal, okay. And you can see that you can bend the sample, right? Now, that's not a problem. If you use an ITO sample, you bend it, you can see the crack, you know, everywhere. Yeah. And it fails to conduct the current. Uh, in this past uh, perpendicular to these cracks. But our structure remained intact after extreme bending. So uh, this work later on, um, actually 2007, uh, MIT Tech Review, uh, Technology Review, uh, write a story about it. You see the title? Big and bright, flexible displays. But in reality, as you can imagine, coming from a laboratory, right, our OLED device is very tiny. I don't remember the exact dimension. It's probably only a few millimeter, less, definitely less than a centimeter. But people writing this article, they can see that this sort of technology can scale, right? can bring to a much larger scale. Mm -hmm. By now, in fact, this eventually evolves into metal mesh uh, structures that many uh, companies actually use it for, uh, for application. I was told I'm using a, a Surface Book uh, Microsoft Surface Book, I was told that the, my touch panel is actually using the metal mesh rather than ITO. Okay. Okay. So the, for all of these, right, you need to not only using a wafer to nano imprint onto another wafer, it's not big enough. So we have to think, come up with ways to make it much bigger, right, a much lower cost and higher throughput. And so that leads to this concept of trying to do this on a continuous fashion. Right? So how to do that? <clears throat> As I alluded to in the discussion, yeah, people have this idea you know, a long time ago. <clears throat> and the reason that we were able to do this is one thing is that we have a lot of things ready. <clears throat> For example, uh, we have developed um, back 2005, uh, a UV curable uh, liquid resist, UV curable you know, liquid photosensitive material, epoxy silicone. So you can just uh, cast it or spin coat it you know, without using any solvent drying. Yeah. And then since it's a liquid, 
you can imprint it with extremely low pressure. Yeah, you don't need any fancy, uh, you know, a mechanical system to apply very large force. Yeah. And at that time, we also come up with a way to easily make a transparent mold out of polymer, yeah, ETFE. Um, it's a, a fluoropolymer that has low surface energy and it's a UV um, transparent. Okay. So this work was done by uh, actually my very first student, uh, Xing Cheng, uh, who uh, after he actually um, spent several years in the uh, United States after being a tenured professor, he went to China and now become a, a professor and also a chair of the material science department in the uh, SASTEC in Shenzhen, Shenzhen. So he has led a very successful group uh, himself. <clears throat> so uh, this is a scheme that uh, my uh, student came up with. Uh, Shang An is a, such a um, talented mechanical engineering student. I was very fortunate to have. Uh, he was the uh, first mechanical engineering student who joined my group. So he made this possible. So this is the scheme that uh, I can come, come up with. Right? So, on the top is a row to row where you take a flexible substrate, you continuously coat this UV curable epoxy silicone, right? And no need of, uh, of curing or uh, solvent evaporation and go directly into the structure. And here uh, you can make a large area UV transparent mold and then print it and use UV light to cure it. This is an application of light, UV light to cure it. Uh, and then you get your final product. In some cases, people would like to have this on a flat, uh, rigid substrate, like glass. Right? Then you can use this so-called roll to plate mode to transfer these patterns onto a piece of glass. So he was able to demonstrate fairly good uh, uh, feature uh, definition. See on the left, uh, the top left is 200 nanometer period, and 100 nanometer pitch. And the bottom is 100 nanometer period continuously printed using this process. So this gives rise to speed. Okay. Sometimes even just the demonstration is uh, is not necessary enough. It doesn't necessarily get the attention of the industry. Right? So you really have to go more, one more step further. Yeah. So a year later, uh, with my uh, uh, push, he actually demonstrated a very scaled. You know, this is a six inch wide setup. Okay. And so he was able to print um, up to four or five inch wide uh, plastic substrate right? and was getting a very good result. Oh, by the way, uh, since uh, the presider of this session is Paul, uh, uh, he has uh, led a successful, a very successful ACS Nano Journal. So any papers that we publish in this talk uh, in ACS Nano, I, I'm I circle them, okay? Um, so, so this is the the rotor uh, nano imprint process, and Sh uh, Shang, um, very talented, he went on to actually invent and develop uh, several more mechanical based continuous process that actually can make these nano to microstructures. Very interesting. Yeah. So on the left is this rotor row. Okay. So you here you have to have a way to make the mold, and sometimes that's many times that's actually could be very challenging for a user right you have to resort to special tools to do that now this left one the second one is much easier okay so you can just take a piece of let's say silicon a hard uh, mold right you cleave it and this has a let's say the nanoscale features and right? some micron scale features and you lean this against a a substrate right and basically apply a small force and you can heat it if you need it uh, for certain material. And basically scribing on the surface. And this will delineate uh, this, this nano gradient, very high speed. This, uh, uh, we can get to in a matter of one minute, you know, one meter per minute. Yeah, it can be even higher. Yeah. So uh, this is something that if you don't have a good facility, very easy to do. Yeah. And this is a uh, uh, localized, uh, these names are also come up with localized um, wrinkle or dynamic wrinkle. Yeah. Even without any features patterned on this uh, piece of silicon, right? Under certain conditions, if you have a hard material coated on a soft material, okay, yeah, this intrinsic stress can automatically generate a wave. 
and give you the right period and and so on and so forth i won't go into detail uh, uh interested uh, audience um now please take a look and some of these in fact can be applied to curved surfaces and you can combine um both of them together to make two-dimensional arrays and we actually use these two-dimensional arrays for an, a couple of uh, very interesting applications uh, i think uh, the, uh, the bottom one is a review article that summarizes uh, many of the features described in these techniques it's all you know, thanks to this very talented student. So now in industry, uh, as I mentioned in the first slide, right, the photo lithography uh, using the so-called stepper is the, the main um, uh, workforce. Okay. Now, whenever you use light to do pattern, you always have to deal with a very simple physics, that is the light diffraction, which you know, we can use this equation. Uh, this might be the only equation I have, right? It's basically the resolution is, is determined by the wavelength of light and the system, which uh, use a numerical aperture, okay? So therefore, to get a higher and higher resolution, one thing you can do is to just keep shrinking the wavelengths, okay? From UV light, to near UV light, you know, to deep UV light, and now the industry goes towards soft X-ray. Now, the lithography, the, the concept is the following. Right? You have the UV light shine on a so-called mask that contains the pattern that you want to produce on the microchip. Okay? And use a reduction lens, objective lens, right? do a 4x, 5x reduction, project that onto the wafer. Okay? And you do this step and repeat, yeah? scan the whole wafer and do the pattern. Very simple right? in concept. But in practice, it's extremely difficult. And that's why in the whole world, right, there are only a couple of companies that they can do this for. SML is, uh, is now the only company that can actually transition to the uh, soft X-ray, okay? So the machinery for doing this is huge, right? And here the laser is using the excimer, deep UV laser, okay? And the mask is over here. This one lens that I shown in this uh, schematic, in reality, it's a stack of lens. This weighs over half a ton. Right? You can show over here. <clears throat> it uses intricate optics to be able to resolve features down to you know let's say 10, 20 nanometer. Right? Very complicated. Yeah. And some people say this is the, perhaps the, the most of advanced machinery that people build on this planet. And I'm not very surprised with this statement. Okay, so this is very capable, right? It's used for making microchips. And UV lithography uh, has an advantage. It doesn't need contact, right? You don't have to like our mold using imprint. You have to print one material into the other, okay? So we were thinking, can we actually extend some of these to, to use, still using UV light, right? Do the pattern, okay? I'll still be able to pattern very small uh, without resorting to this expensive machinery. Right? And in the past, again, you look into the literature, people have done this, people have demonstrated. Right? So this is a sort of lithographic pattern that you want to get, you know, very nice, tall and straight. And you can use this to, uh, let's say, transfer this pattern by etching the substrate and materials and so on, okay? Now, a very well-known work that published uh, 2005 Okay, was done by uh, actually uh, he, he, uh, the Iconex speaker last year, uh, uh, Nick Fung, uh, when he was a student with Professor Xiang Zhang. Yeah, very nice work. So <clears throat> they basically try to image something really small by using you know a, a ordinary UV light, typical UV light. Right, the lens they're not using the stack of lens, but instead they just simply use a thin layer of silver. The thin layer of silver acts as a so-called super lens. It can actually resolve very tiny features in near field. So you can see that now the photoresist, right, is spin cast directly onto the silver field. Okay. Now a year later, <clears throat> another group from uh, Australia, uh, Blakey Group, also demonstrated something similar. See planar silver right? and uh, the mask on top, or double silver layers, multiple layer field. 
So both of them were able to demonstrate, for instance, using UV as ordinary UV light, you can resolve, I don't recall the exact dimension, but probably 70 nanometers, right? Uh, much smaller than the wavelengths. And uh, this is sort of getting beyond the you know, the diffraction limit, okay? And work done by a Blakey group also similar. Okay. But you will see some difference from this ideal uh, structure people want to have in manufacturing. This is something you need to have in order to use it for a practical purpose. First of all, you see uh, this is using AFM image. Right? The pattern features are very shallow, maybe you know, up to 20 nanometers deep. Okay. And on the right hand side, <clears throat> You can see that these scales, lateral scale, probably I mean, less than 10 micron. Right? Even within 10 micron, the patterns are very non-uniform. Again, these are not going to be very useful for practical purpose. Okay. So the problem is very shallow and low contrast. And small area, even small area is not uniform. Okay. So we have to understand why this is uh, the case. Okay. Now, the shallow can be easily understood. Because you're using a UV light, the features of the mask is smaller, much smaller. So diffractive light, right, they cannot propagate very far. They're all evanescent wave, meaning they decay exponentially okay, uh, from the lens. Right? So therefore, you can only expose the photoresist near the silver uh, field. Okay? That's why it's shallow. Right? Now, <clears throat> uh, why it's not uniform? Okay, this super lens has a very interesting feature it can pass the uh, light with very uh, high order of spatial, spatial order frequencies. And this is needed, in fact, if you want to pattern arbitrary features, okay? As we show in this uh, 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 calculation, yeah, it can pass many orders. <clears throat> However, if we want to just simply create a periodic structure, okay, there you only need uh, two diffraction orders, plus minus. Okay, give rise to this propagating wave and the inter interference of two counter-propagating wave, right? Give rise to a sinusoidal function. <clears throat> okay. Now we know from simple mass, if you start to add other uh, Fourier series, higher orders, they start to distort this waveform. Okay. And that's why if you have too many orders for periodic patterns, it naturally become a very non-uniform. This is our understanding of the problem, okay? So our goal is to uh, try to address this. Okay. Our target is now, we want to still get very deep sub wavelengths, but we want to get a high aspect ratio. So they are practical, can be useful. And we want to be able to pattern large area with good uniformity. And again, it's as nano people, okay? <clears throat> the strategy we come up with is that uh, we're gonna use a very thick layer of photoresist, okay? But that alone doesn't work because the wave is still evanescent when it's scattered off from a very uh, uh, narrow band, uh, uh, narrow width uh, grading mask, okay? But here we want to use the photoresist as a part of an optical waveguide. We know the optical waveguide at the edge, the wave is also evanescent. So the two evanescent waves, they can couple, again, using a, uh, uh, you know, a molecular structure. So if you have two wave functions, right, the tails can overlap. Yeah, that can couple. So here, once you couple, you can actually uh, transfer this, a lot of the information into this photoresist layer. It's shown in this um, calculation and right, simulation. Now you can see the light pattern intensity, right, distributed uniformly throughout the whole entire uh, photoresist thickness. Very nice. Okay, now, while this works in theory, many, many things work in theory, but not necessarily in practice. So we have to try it in the experiment. Unfortunately, this works pretty well to our satisfaction. So here we use the ordinary UV light, 405, it's actually uh, even blue, near, near blue. But we are able to pattern 55 nanometer feature size and with a very decent aspect ratio, you know, two to one. And we, we are able to actually get three to one aspect ratio. With such aspect ratio, you can actually use this thing to pattern it, you know, transfer a pattern into another layer and so on and so forth, okay? One other um, problem is here is that 
the uh, the period of the pattern is one half of the period on the on the mask. So the, on the mask is 245 nanometer, which is still very small. Yeah, you have to use in our case using the electron beam lithography to pattern it. Okay, so that's uh, still a limitation. So we want to address that problem as well. We want a mask to be <coughs> A much bigger we can actually do with photo lithography. So this is the second work, okay, that we come up with. It's using a, uh, a multi-layer structure. Yeah. This ENZ stands for absolute near zero. So what it means is this is um, this metal dielectric multi-layer. So this multi-layer you can tell is anisotropic. In fact, the uh, electrical effective permittivity along the horizontal and vertical direction, they are different. In fact, one can be even negative, right? And we want the, the horizontal component to be close to zero. That's where absolute near zero comes from. And this gives rise to a uh, desirable uh, 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 wave. Yeah? So we treat this as a waveguide as well. Yeah. And <clears throat> so the nice feature about this is not only you can actually form these periodic patterns, but now, we could actually use much larger period, okay? We can use higher order diffraction and couple, let them interfere to create much smaller period patterns, right? So that this is an experimental result. Now the photo mask period is now 700 nanometer period, okay? Much easier to make. Now we can still get the pattern feature size less than 60 nanometer with a very decent aspect ratio, okay? This is another ACS nano paper. So uh, with this, it's actually make it much easier to, uh, to, to do in, in practice. Since earlier, we talked about, we, we can use the row to row printing right, to make it scalable. Now the question is, can we possibly make this photo lithography process also row to row continuous process? Okay. This actually I have to uh, um, um, thank to some previous work uh, done by my uh, former uh, postdoc in my group. So we have attempted uh, uh, UV sort of uh, lithography on a continuous fashion. The previous uh, incarnation is so-called roller phase shift lithography. So what it is, is that uh, you have a, a, a photoresist coated on the substrate that conti continuous moving, okay? Now, um, the, uh, you, you use a U, uh, coarse tube Okay, with this transparent UV light, okay, and you can put your light source inside. And you make your a mask surrounding the uh, the tube. In this case, it's a phase shift mask, which means it's actually totally transparent, nothing blocking the light. It only have this depth contrast, but the depths, the edge of the depths, can give rise to optical phase the interference. You can have destructive interference, for instance. Right? Then you can actually make very tiny features. Even the pattern, the square, can be let's say ten microns. Yeah. So, for instance, you can actually uh, down to you know um, hundred, uh, let's say a hundred, a couple of hundred nanometers. So at that time, we use this pattern to etch into a metal film underneath. And again, we demonstrated a very transparent conductor. Yeah. And this work was done by uh, uh, a former student in my group, Ngu Kwak is now associate professor, and I believe a vice dean at uh, Kangku National University in Korea. And now he actually has a company actually uh, try to commercialize some of the technology. Now, so come back to the plasmonic uh, aspect. Right? So this is the setup we're using. We have the uh, this special mask wrapping around the cores, and the substrate is moving, you know, on the, on the moving stage. So. So if you do things properly, in fact, you can actually get it done. Yeah. So you can do it on a continuous fashion. You can get it as deep submicron structures. Now, uh, this is for a very small, right? Sometimes, in fact, let's say for touch panel, right? the feature side don't need to touch circuitry. They don't need to be that small. So you don't have to resort to these sort of a, uh, technology. You can do a simple um, ordinary mask. A photo mask, yeah, through the photo roller lithography. Yeah, just make a flexible mask around your course tube and shine the light through it, and you can do it. So, uh, 
previously, you know, uh, um, because this is actually a very gentle process, you have to, you don't have to imprint into the material. Right? You can actually apply to, uh, in, in our case, we demonstrated on a, a, a layer of graphene, a pattern on graphene. Graphene itself is not a transparent conductor, but it's too resistive, you know, even by doping. But one strategy is that you can couple the uh, metal mesh with the graphene. And so the metal mesh serves as a uh, electrical highway, right? It can distribute the current, you know, very fast, uh, easily. And you use the graphene for local uh, transport, right? So then we demonstrate a flexible um, uh, light emitting devices. All that you can see, you can bend it, no problem. But if you use uh, ITO, again, you'll see cracks everywhere. These are the work apart from uh, uh, Dr. Kwok, also two other students. Uh, Zhang Ok, he's another mechanical engineering student, and Hong Suk Yun was a, a postdoc at that time. Uh, both are now associate professors in Korea. And Hong Suk Yun is really an expert to developing <clears throat> several uh, uh, scalable fabrication techniques. And he has also have good expertise in making OLED, uh, polymer-based OLED. So for instance, Later on, he developed uh, in my lab this uh, lamination process for making organic photovoltaic devices. It's quite interesting. And just show that one example, using his setup, he can you know, basically do a row-to-row -row coating of a conducting polymer heat up over a very large sheet. It's good uniformity. <clears throat> so uh, this is, I think, uh, uh, you know, down on the patterning side, let me, uh, <clears throat> it's my next, yeah. Let me come back to the color. Um, I talk about various of colors. Black is actually another color. <clears throat> the question here is uh, how do we actually make a very black uh, material? It's called a perfect black. Okay. This can be done by another nano material based on carbon, yeah, carbon nanotube. So you can see that um, if you grow this arrayed nanotube in the form of a forest, right? You can grow it on a, uh, in this case, a piece of silicon, right? You etch in a, like a three-dimensional tank on it, okay? On the microscope, optical microscope, you are very tiny, right, tens of microns. Of course, you can see it. But if you grow uh, the CNTs onto this tank, and again, you bring it back onto the microscope, nowhere you can find the tank. It totally disappeared, invisible to you. And this is a, a, a piece of sample that holding the hand, held in the hand, very black, a perfect black. It essentially uh, uh, doesn't reflect any light into your eye. <clears throat> okay. And the, the reason for the, doing this is that um, <clears throat> you can see uh, it looks very dense, like a forest, right? But the carbon, the multiple carbon nanomaterial, the percentage is only about 1%. So most of it is air. And the surface you can see is very uh, random. It's a deep. So light, when the light coming from air, right, into this slightly denser air, if you call it, it don't see a clear interface. It's not like light hitting on a, a surface of water, right? It can reflect very strongly. So here there's almost no reflection, very little. Okay? But as the light goes through this uh, interface, it gets gradually ad absorbed by the multiple carbon nanotube because it's a very good light absorber. So that's why this produced a perfect black. A perfect black. Okay. This work was done <clears throat> by a, uh, uh, a former postdoc who um, spent close to three years in my lab, uh, Hao Fei Shu. And he's now um, also established his own very successful uh, uh, career in the, one of the institutes in uh, Chinese Academy. His name is too long, it's difficult to translate into English, so I copied that in. The Chinese over here. Yeah. Uh, among uh, many of his uh, great accomplishments is that uh, he and his colleagues, with the, uh, the funding of the VC, right, to basic, basically mass produce graphene, make large sheets, much larger than you know, a piece of paper on a large scale. So really make that into product. Impressive results. So um, now. This carbon nanotube, you know, here we talk about uh, absorbing uh, basically visible light, right? But it's a broad broadband absorber. It can absorb UV light, IR light, uh, even actually we found even terahertz light. Yeah. So 
terahertz is a frequency that uh, falls in between what you can detect easily with optical device versus what you can detect easily with a microwave device. It's in this uh, sort of a zone that's difficult to handle by both. Okay. And so terahertz is, uh, <clears throat> itself is an interesting field. Uh, we have a uh, previous uh, icon speakers talk about this technology before, right? So here, uh, we're no expertise, uh, have no expertise in terahertz, but we want to convert the terahertz into something that we can detect. Uh, so we want to convert into acoustic wave uh, by using this carbon nanofuel. So basically, you can see the idea is that you shoot uh, this uh, terahertz pulse laser, right? Onto uh, this black piece is carbon nanotube, okay? And it generates acoustic wave by the so-called photoacoustic effect. So essentially any material can absorb light energy, <clears throat> okay? It can have an instantaneous heating, right? Instantaneous try to thermal expand. And that can generate a mechanical wave. So as long as you have a sensitive device that can pick up this acoustic pressure and you will be able to produced uh, a response, yeah. So <clears throat> this is the, what the carbon nanotube looks like. We mix it with a, uh, a material, PDMS, very often used in academics, because PDMS is one of the material polymer materials that has high uh, thermal, co uh, thermal expansion coefficient. So it's very useful for this process. <clears throat> uh, this strategy, uh, yeah. So now acoustic detection is done by another device we uh, developed in my lab, is a polymer-based ring resonator, okay? So basically what it is, is acoustic wave imprinted upon this waveguide. It changed the light propagation property. And so therefore it produced a, a light intensity output. Yeah, so it's transducer, transduce acoustic wave in the light pulse. Then you can use a typical photo detector to pick it up, okay? So this uh, strategy of, um, yeah, no, it actually worked very well. And not only can detect, we actually did a very simple sort of imaging. Uh, the object we image is, uh, is a piece of paper. I put an um, uh, aluminum foil in the, in the shape of cross over it. And we compare our device versus a commercial piezoelectric, um, uh, piezoelectric transducer. So the, on the lower left, this is the uh, commercial transducer. Of course, the cross can be easily imaged because it blocks the uh, terahertz light. But the edge of this uh, paper, you can hardly see, right? But our device, you can see the edge of the uh, paper very clearly because the, the signal is much weaker. It's simply scattered, okay? So uh, you can do this uh, simple imaging by scanning it. So this has the advantage of very compact entirely room temperature, no cooling uh, heating, and very sensitive, and you can do a real-time response. Yeah. So here, this carbon nanotube, you know, mixing with uh, uh, the um, uh, PDMS, this was the work of uh, Hing Wang Ba, a former uh, student in Manila, now as an associate professor at SKKU in Korea. Yeah. He continued on working on this. This terahertz uh, detection work is done by uh, Another student, actually from Taiwan, uh, Song Yang Chen, who is now associate professor at the uh, uh, University of Michigan and Shanghai Jiao Tong Joint Institute. Yeah. Outstanding work. So, and Hing Wang Bak, Dr. Bak also come up with a strategy to produce much stronger photoacoustic wave yeah. by inventing this, uh, what we call the photoacoustic lens. Okay, just like any optical lens, okay, the photoacoustic wave generated on the surface because of the curvature naturally will focus for a very tiny spot. And then we can actually use this so-called um, laser shadow graph to image this wave propagation. You can see that wave propagate and eventually uh, convert to a, a tiny spot. And at this point, the negative pressure can actually cause a bubble to grow, okay? And this bubble will grow with time eventually and it will uh, collapse. And creating a shock wave. Uh, so you can actually re real time see this whole process. The shock wave has a very strong disruptive power, mechanical disruptive power. So you could actually use it for something. Yeah. So for instance, he and later on uh, another student, uh, He Hua Li, uh, demonstrated you can actually use it as a, a sonic cutting tool. Okay. If you think about manufacturing, 
This is an invisible tool. You, you don't see anything, but the focused sound wave can actually cut materials out. Yeah? So for example, this is done by polymer or gels. Yeah? And using this uh, photoacoustic generated wave, right, you can focus features very small down to about you know, your hair diameter. So, and later on, uh, actually, uh, Hilman Buck also showed that you can actually detach cells one by one. Yeah. Since this is on the manufacturing, I won't go into the, the biomedical aspect. Another feature uh, that, that Tei Hua Li found is that if you focus the, this wave to an air and water interface, right, you could actually uh, create a, a micro jet, the jet into the air with high momentum. Yeah. So now this come up with some interesting application, right? So you could actually use this as a printing technique. Now, earlier, Professor Huang talked about electrohydrodynamic printing. Right? One of the uh, features they try to resolve is that the inject printing, the material cannot be very viscous, okay? Otherwise, it will simply clog the, the nozzle, right? So here, what we have is a totally nozzle-free printing technique. Yeah. Uh, our objective is also, one of them is to print very viscous materials that cannot be handled by typical like, inject printing. Uh, this is an ongoing project. We already have uh, some very promising uh, results, hopefully uh, reporting in the future. This is another uh, light and sound enabled uh, sort of manufacturing, uh, new manufacturing technique. Okay. Now, uh, in discussion, I, I alluded to, you know, we have um, uh, want to actually come to, come, come to a very simple structure. So, Earlier on the colors, I talk about these nanoscale features. Right? Uh, so the question is, can we actually do something simpler without any pattern? Yeah. And that was a question raised by a company sponsor uh, <laughs> back several years ago. Yeah. They asked us to actually use planar structures to produce colors. Right? In this case, to produce a nice red color that doesn't matter which angle you look at it, it looks red. Okay. This is not a, not a very trivial task, but we were able to solve it yeah, by using a few uh, simple layer structure. Yeah. So it involves a uh, very ordinary material, nothing colored, right? Amorphous silicon is absorbing. Silicon nitride is a, is a transparent. Yeah. So you're arranged in such a fashion, it's like a photonic crystal, but only involves a few layers. Yeah. And to get the angle sort of independent, and many colors, uh, optical resonance, I would say, it depends on the angle, right? So here we, uh, uh, to simply put it, you want to make the band flat such that it have less angle dependence. Yeah. So you can see that uh, this red uh, sample, right? Yes, indeed. You look at it even 70 degrees, it still, still remains red. Another feature is that it's actually very high uh, reflection. You know, here, the experiment, right? It give you over 90% reflection, very bright red color reflection. Yeah. And using this cleaner structure. So indeed, just by using you know, ordinary materials, uh, layer structure, you can actually produce colors. And you can, uh, earlier I mentioned this very black sample, right? That's using specially grown carbon nanotube. Now here, later on, we demonstrate that using multi-layer structure, we want to mimic that to get a very broad, very broadband absorption. So this is a structure that I come up with. Yeah. And it, it consists of multiple material, but the, the idea here is that it creates multiple optical resonances. Yeah. And certain material is responsible for absorption at certain wavelengths that you know, indicated the bottom panel. Okay? And the overlap of these resonances right, give rise to a broadband absorption. Yeah. And, oops, oh, please. Okay, here. So you can see that uh, the, the, uh, the sample looks very black. In fact, uh, I think in the visible uh, wavelengths, it absorbs 99% of the light uh, using very simple layer structure. <clears throat> so the, the development layer structure was really uh, get a big push yeah, by uh, some work uh, from industry, the Toyota. Okay? They've also been developing <clears throat> the structural colors and the so-called structural blue. Yeah. Uh, their motivation is that if you use organic dyes, right, they degrade under UV light. 
and also they're not very bright, okay, because it's based on absorption, right? So they are, probably can reflect 50% of the light. Okay. Now they have uh, developed this structural blue color. They in fact applied it on the industrial scale to the Lexus LC500, yeah, this vehicle in 2018. So there is a very nice YouTube video, interested uh, audience can take a look. It's very interesting, describing a, uh, I would say, a industrial scale, how they actually make these layer structures and pigments. It again starts with material that doesn't have any color. I, I think they mentioned zinc sulfide and aluminum. <clears throat> and using a row to row process to deposit these layers in a continuous fashion. Okay, these are a snapshot from the video. <clears throat> um, and they can break into pigments and they can actually coat right, like a paint. And that's, <clears throat> they can actually create this very nice looking um, uh, structural blue color. And that doesn't exist in nature, uh, very uh, nice blue color. So, um, yeah, so this is a painting. Yeah. Okay, now, <clears throat> uh, so we, we want to actually follow your example, right? Um, their structure, we don't exactly know, but we could uh, possibly guess. Yeah, but let me uh, give you one example to simply uh, explain the principle, right? Again, just a few layers. <clears throat> so here, you can see that um, uh, shows a uh, few layers. And it consists of a top a thin silver layer and the bottom thick silver layer and savaging a, a dielectric layer. This is, in, in this case, amorphous silicon. So the two silver layer basically act as a mirror. It's reflecting the light back and forth, okay, forming a resonance, okay, the so-called Faber-Perot resonance. But this one in optics, it will be called an asymmetric Faber-Perot cavity. The top silver is, is thinner, so light can, can actually reflect back. And it also serves the purpose of partially absorbing the light. So therefore, if you set this structure correctly, you can let the absorption occurs in you know around 500, 550, or 760, right? Now, if you do that, then this can provide the what a cyan magenta yellow color. <clears throat> and the reason we use amorphous silicon is again take the advantage of high refractive index, and also a, a very interesting uh, uh, face angle uh, upon reflection. Uh, that face angle was actually the uh, work inspired by, I believe, last week's uh, uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Kass, when he was a, a student at Harvard. So, and here uh, we found that, okay, another thing is that we want this color to be color, um, angle independent, right? So that if you break into pigments, it, it still look the same color, doesn't matter which angle. So this can actually give, give rise to this angle independence. Even though the light propagation in, in this layer, right? Of course, it depends on the angle. But the light reflection from the uh, interface of the silver and the amorphous silicon also has an angle dependence. And they happen to sum up to basically zero, okay? So that's also multiple integers of two pi. So that makes you know, angle independent. It's a very interesting effect, uh, put in a, a practical use, okay? Yeah, so this was the work of, uh, uh, Kyute Lee, who is uh, uh, assistant professor now at the uh, Inha University in Korea. Okay. Now, um, so here it gives you a cyan magenta yellow color, right? But how do you make blue? It's this RGB, it's a primary color. So you only using this cannot do it. But you can just add another layer on top of it. Yeah. Uh, it's like anti-reflection layer, yeah. four layers. Now you can actually create a primary RGB color. So this work, we actually uh, uh, provided much details on the, on the theoretical analysis, you know, how do you actually design structures? This is a work done by uh, uh, a postdoc, Jiang Mei Yang, and uh, at that time, a visiting scholar, uh, Dr. Zhong Liu, who uh, I actually just got to know uh, this morning. He, he was uh, promoted to a full professor at the uh, Nanjing uh, University of Science and Technology. So congratulate. And so they actually lay out the, 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 the basic principles. So simply put it, right? So here we want to have absorption. Yeah, let's say we want to uh, create, a, a, let's say a, a green, right? I want absorption in, in both the red and the blue region. 
and typical materials cannot give rise to that absorption. So and such material, in fact, based on this analysis, doesn't really exist. So what we did is that I suggest them to look at you know combination of materials, okay, couple materials together to try to mimic what you really want to get, okay. So that's what they did, you know, uh, two layer materials and together, and you can actually produce really pure RGB color and very high reflectivity, very bright color. Now earlier I mentioned uh, the, uh, the dye, right, has a UV sensitivity. It can be great, right? Yeah. But UV uh, dyes, they do have absorption. So here we put a very thin layer of dye into the stack right, to perform the absorption that's needed. Okay. And again, you can get very pure color. And then another nice advantage is that even the dye is only 30 nanometer, right? So if you put this dye on a, on a, on a piece of glass, you hardly see any color because it's so thin. Okay. But putting this optical cavity, it significantly enhances the effect because light travels many bounds. Okay. Another thing is that although the, uh, the dye is sensitive to UV, but in here, in the cavity, the UV absorption by this dye is much, much weaker. So you can see after 15 days exposing UV light, the color doesn't change. Okay. So it's a combination of this hybrid structure could actually make it a, a work too. So um, the, the, the nice work from uh, the Toyota, the Lexus Structural Blue is very beautiful. And they are, I don't know how many vehicles they are able to paint, um, but they only painted on the Lexus vehicle because of what? Because uh, it's very expensive, as you can imagine, even using this road to road. Yeah. So in fact, they choose the uh, Lexus uh, hybrid vehicle. I believe, again, the hybrid vehicle is among the most expensive, right? So the price difference uh, is, is less. So, so, so when I start to think how it's possible, we can actually make this slightly cheaper, you know, more cheaper than, than uh, using this vacuum process. Now, vacuum process, deposition is always very expensive. So what could be a possible solution for that? Okay, our solution that we come up with is a solution process. Okay, so basically you don't deposit this in a vacuum, you deposit in a beaker, right, solution, yeah, by electrochemical deposition process. So, so in fact, after many trials, you can actually able to achieve this. So on the uh, upper right, you can see these layered structures by electro deposition and down to tens of nanometer thick, reasonably smooth, can give rise to optical quality. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, using this uh, simple three layer structure, you can create the cyan magenta yellow color. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> this could be leading to potentially much cheaper uh, uh, process, but another great advantage, I, I think, is that now it doesn't have to be flat, right? You can have curved uh, object, like shown in the here. You take a stainless steel, steel spoon, okay, and you can actually coat uh, different colors on it. You can take an, an arbitrary 3D object, basically. It is possible to coat a nice color coating onto it. Yeah, that I feel could be the potential um, impact of this process in the future. Okay, now, uh, maybe one last topic. So, Another one about color is that earlier I showed these passive color coatings, right? We want to make it a, a sort of active device. Yeah. So one problem to address is the, uh, is the uh, solar panel. I mean, solar panels are always black, right, mostly. So put on the rooftop, it can only be put on the rooftop, right? Uh, in cities, there's only a very tiny rooftop. Most areas you cannot use, okay? And there are people who are trying to be, uh, you know, uh, creative. Yeah, it uh, doesn't make match, like, you know, put this into a construct, an architecture of flower. But in nature, we never see, I've never seen at least, any flower with uh, uh, the black uh, and, uh, flowers, right? So here we, we, uh, we want to say, okay, is it possible we can actually make these panels, panels to be colored that can fit the environment, right? So I'll come back to this uh, previous structure. You can see that it's using two silvers and sandwiching what? A semiconductor, right? So this is not very far from an optoelectronic device, a solar cell, because the silver are electro, they can collect current. Okay? This structure itself cannot do the job because 
it is symmetric to charge. The electrons and holes, for example, it can go both directions. So we have to break that symmetry yeah. by introducing these additional layers. Okay, we call it charge transport layers. The electron transporting layer is the organic ICBA and the hole transporting layer is palladium oxide. Right? Once you break the symmetry, then it's possible to collect charges into different electrodes right, to produce a DC current. That's what solar cell does. Okay. Now, the optical response of this bottom one, you can see it is very similar to the top. Yeah. Adding these layers doesn't change the property because organic layers these are very thin, you know, oxide, they are, they are lower index, so they don't change the optical properties that much. But they do work nicely as a solar cell. You can see this IV characteristic, and this one is the external quantum efficiency. So, <clears throat> and now, now you can make it colored, you can bring different colors together, you can make a, a, a logo out of it. And this, in the back side, there's the electrode. If it's exposed to sunlight, it can actually generate electric power. Okay. And you can also make it semi-transparent or in fact, very transparent like in uh, this picture. But certainly there is a trade-off, right? Once you make it very transparent, um, the uh, efficiency will drop it's very drastically. Okay. Now recently, to, to <clears throat> if you really want to get a transparent solar cell, right? Uh, you have to come up with other strategy. Uh, this work is a more recent work in collaboration with my colleague at the University of Michigan. Professor Steve Forrest, who has a lot of expertise in the organic semiconductors, and they have actually this material that it can absorb infrared spectrum of the solar light. Yeah. So together, we designed a much more sophisticated optical structure to basically pass as much visible light as possible and absorb as much um, infrared light as possible. Now, I won't go into the detail, but here you can see that you can get power efficiency of 8%, very significant. <clears throat> and it's fairly transparent, okay? Now, another strategy to make a black silicon panel color is you take a already a very high efficiency solar panel, okay? That's very widely developed, for example, in China, right? So you come up with a coating, a special coating, such that it can reflect a narrow band of light, now give rise to color, but let most of the light still pass through it and absorbed by the silicon panel. And this is what we did, the strategy, okay? So of course the efficiency will drop, but not very significantly because we want to reflect a narrow band. Yeah. But then you can make it any color you want. So this sort of technology, I think also has a very good potential. Uh, like in this one, omnipresent solar. <laughs> you can put this sort of solar panels in you know, many other places, right? that actually uh, it could be good looking, you know, it's very nice colors. Like in highway system, right? We have the sound barriers everywhere, right? Especially in cities. You could put panels over there to generate power. Right? Or, I, you know, in the past year, there are that, um, proposals putting solar panel on the, on the road. I think that's a lot tougher to accomplish. Anyway, that's a, you know, hopefully maybe we can use solar panels to color our world and simultaneously acting as a, um, <clears throat> green energy source. Okay, now this is the last, very last one. So here, I'll come back to the same, same structure again. So you see that we use amorphous silicon silver, right? There's one material I didn't discuss at all. It's PC, PTCBI, it's only five nanometers. This is organic semiconductor, but in this colored uh, uh, structure, it doesn't actually serve much purpose. The only purpose it serves is that we want to do produce a thin and smooth silver film. So this PTCBA magically helps that. Yeah, and here we use a 18 nanometer silver and it's smooth. Getting silver to be very smooth uh, for those who actually done deposition, right? Is not easy. Yeah. For instance, if you deposit nan nine nanometer of silver onto a glass, it's basically become grains. It may not be even connected, okay? It's not, may, may not be conducting. It has huge optical loss as, as well. Yeah. But we come up with a strategy uh, several years back. Yeah. So again, you see as now. One. So you can see that now we can produce a few nanometers of silver, very smooth and thin. Yeah. And this is done not by using pure silver, by adding some other 
impurity, if you wish, and do doping, small amount. In this case, for example, adding small amount of aluminum, you can actually make it smooth. So making smooth silver is actually a pretty big deal because silver is perhaps still the most widely used material for plasmonic, a very important field of uh, uh, nanophotonics, metamaterials, and so on. Okay. So we show that if you make the silver smooth, like the surface plasma mold, right, you can let it propagate 10 times longer yeah, by reducing the roughness. So this is the work of uh, another student, Cheng Zhang, yeah, who actually, uh, after graduating a few years postdoc in, in, in the US, he joined the faculty at Huazhong University of Science Technology, who is now a colleague of Professor Hong. Um, he joined the last, uh, last uh, uh, January, which is now good timing in Wuhan, uh, but he did uh, very well uh, uh, in academic uh, area. So here you can see that um, if you actually, um, another problem with the pure silver is that after deposition, you take it out of the, uh, the vacuum chamber. Um, in like 15, 30 minutes, you can visually see it's becoming dark. It actually degrades that fast. Okay. But our film was adding small amount of aluminum uh, after six months, at least in Michigan weather, like we don't see any notice, noticeable change, much more stable. Now, silver film, if you make it thick enough, it's continuous. But if you heat it, for example, 300 degrees, it would be what? Like almost like water droplets. But this film, no problem. It can stand this temperature <clears throat> as long as you can do it in nitrogen, nitrogen to prevent oxidation. So it's much more stable. So we did a little study on the uh, mechanistic, right? So, for example, if you would uh, start uh, the film deposition, stop it, let's say three, three nanometer, you use AFM to take a look, right? Uh, you can see that pure silver, right? It already starts to grow these very large grains. On the other hand, on this aluminum doped silver, it's much smaller grain size, okay? And it's very distributed. Right? So on top of this, the crystal won't grow big. Now you can see that the crystals on the left, are very big on the left, on the right is much smaller. Right, so just uh, discussing more detail in this ACS nano paper. All right, so once you make it thin, it has an interesting property. Right? Uh, earlier, I, I said, you know, to make metal uh, transparent, one way is to cut into mesh, right? like window, right? you can leave opening. But the other one is to make it thin. A prime example is graphene, right? Graphite is opaque, but if you take it one sheet of graphene, it's extremely transparent. So we can make uh, silver very thin, it becomes very transparent. Yeah. You see, especially at the UV range, yeah, down to 300, it's much more transparent than, than ITO light, uh, ITO electrode. Yeah. But this range is not, yeah. But this can be solved, yeah, because metal is simply more reflecting. So by adding another layer of, uh, let's say, zinc oxide on top of uh, the silver and make it much more transparent, okay? It's because the zinc oxide here is acting as an uh, anti-reflection layer. Okay. Now, zinc oxide, uh, for those who are working on devices, is also a very useful electronic material. Right? It transports electrons. And that's where we actually use it for making solar cells yeah, in that previous work. As well, later on, we show that you can actually get even thinner silver film continuous on tantalum oxide. So it depends on the substrate. Yeah. And and here, using the tantalum oxide, you can actually use it as an external spacer to tune the optical resonance uh, uh, region. And this was the work of a uh, former postdoc, Liu Weizhou, who later on uh, uh, joined uh, as a research scientist, University of Toledo, did a very fantastic work in peroxide solar cells. Now he's a professor at Sichuan University in China. It was a very successful career. Now. <clears throat> So uh, now the uh, this transparent electrode could also be used in OLED. Okay, why would one make it, use it in OLED? I think in earlier Professor Huang's work, he also alluded to uh, this light guiding uh, phenomenon. Right. So ITO is a high index material. It tends to guide light not very well. So even you have a materials 100% electrically, electro-optically sort of efficiency but the amount of light extracted is always limited. Yeah. So uh, because the light is guided you know, because of high index, uh, there are in the past uh, different strategies, for example, patterning 
corrugation or using micro lens that Professor Fong mentioned. Yeah, these, un, you know, increase the uh, the uh, the complexity of the fabrication, also the cost, and some are not really uh, compatible with the internal sort of device. So we want to make it simpler. We're thinking if we replace the ITO with our thin silver, because it's very thin, and silver the index is very low. In fact, the real part of the index of silver is close to zero. So we should be in principle eliminate, right, or reduce this weight guiding property. And that's in fact what we did in the previous work uh, using uh, a polymer emitting device, uh, material, the super yellow. You can make uh, these multi-layer structures. Yeah, you can see that uh, compared with ITO device, the efficiency is higher, right? overall efficiency is higher. In the more recent work that was presented this last month in IEDM in the US, uh, the student made um, a, a OLED device out of a small molecule and experimentally improved the light guiding is totally eliminated. And another, uh, uh, of course, the advantage is that this is very flexible. You can see this OLED device is bended to a very small radius curvature and still works very nicely. So that's the, uh, uh, the potential of this. So this is sort of, a, we have to compare. This is a good technology. Yeah. And how is it compared with other existing technologies? And we always want to uh, do a uh, due diligence study. Right? So ITO on the left is very good and it's dominating the, the market till now for over half a century. But there are other uh, technologies, metal mesh <clears throat> and uh, silver nanowires. But these are all commercialized. Right? Compared with this, I can say that um, our uh, optical properties are very good yeah, and very low haze because it's continuous film, unlike the metal mesh or silver nano wires because they scatter light, right? And manufacturing is very simple. Yeah. For example, silver nano wire, you have to use you know, very different chemical processes. Right? So it offers these uh, a number of advantages. Um, <clears throat> So uh, another <laughs> work, if you coat the uh, metal film onto a, a plastic, right? Uh, typically it's going to be a little bit more opaque, but we found uh, through this work, we found that by proper design, you can actually, after coating these multiple layers, you can make the film even more slightly transparent than plastic, the PET itself. Yeah, that's me holding a piece of glass. You can see it's very transparent. And this is, is actually not violating any fundamental physics. Yeah. The trick here is that these multiple layers together, they function as a type of anti-reflection. So it actually increased the light transmission slightly. This is a work of uh, 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 Cheng Gangji, another student in my, in my group. <clears throat> uh, this is he actually holding a large sheet of half meter wide, uh, uh, this transparent conductor, okay? Uh, this definitely can be made on an industrial scale. And we recently have a, a review article uh, we're interested in this topic and I'm summarizing some other work uh, in this area. So <clears throat> Cheng Gang, um, he, um, uh, he, he, was, he, he could actually join the effort to commercialize this technology, but he decided to pursue his own interest, his own passion, which is the topic of his PhD work. Yeah. So his PhD work is on the structural color. He's now the CTO of a, a startup company. And they're actually making very good progress. Here you can see that uh, he's a picture he shared with me. Uh, it, structural colored pigments, very nice looking, yeah. On the bottom, uh, uh, these actually, uh, if you see the real object, it's much more appealing. It's very pure color, uh, better than uh, things you can buy on, on the market. Yeah. And this uh, in the middle is actually color change with the angle. And this will also have interesting utilities uh, in, 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 in some applications. Okay, so the last slide I want to see is actually, you know, from laboratory, uh, this initial discovery, and to try to find a, a, a fabrication, make it scalable, to eventually um, put it in a real industrial scale, mass produce, and to put it as a real product, it's a long way, and it's very challenging, and advanced manufacturing is, is really the key, yeah, but uh, the uh, university have licensed this uh, to a startup company that made a pretty good progress in the last couple of years. Here, uh, not only this transparent film is actually made into a large screen touch panel, 
this was a <clears throat> short video they shared with me. It's actually, uh, uh, I think it's a so-called Sea Touch Expo in Shenzhen uh, a year before. You can see that it's actually multi-touch on a large screen. Okay, yeah, so with that, I'd like to, to end my talk and thank everyone for, for listening and uh, I'd be happy to uh, take any questions if, if there are some. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Here, let me bring up uh, the questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had several, I had to trim them down a little bit uh, because of the time. Uh, but the first question is, uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, Nano Imprint is a promising process for flexible electronics. Do you think it, be, it can be integrated with commercialized IC chips accepted in the market and widely used? Oh, um, sorry. Um, how, do I, how do I see the question? Oh, okay. No. Oh, I just, I, oh, no, I no, can no, read them okay. to you. Because, uh, it's okay. I just, uh, sorry, I, I couldn't see the chat. I, I'm sorry, I was running a little bit over time, Paul. Yeah. Oh, no, no problem. <laughs> Do you think it can be integrated with commercial IC chips? Yeah, except in the market, yes. Uh, I think so. In fact, um, I'm, uh, I, I cannot say with 100% uh, positivity, but um, a US-based company, um, Molecular Imprint, yeah. In fact, uh, my student was hired over there. And this company was later on sold to a um, uh, Japanese company, um, uh, Canon. Yeah. And Canon was one of the other <clears throat> uh, big manufacturer for uh, uh, photo lithography tools, but they didn't get into the, uh, uh, the, uh, the EUV lithography. So there's, uh, I think that they really um, put emphasis on the uh, nano imprint. They made a, a huge progress. I, I listened to some, uh, some talks, very impressive. You know, using one uh, wafer to print one mold to print you know, many hundreds of thousands of copies, yeah, on an industrial scale. So um, I think it, it definitely has a, a potential. Let me just point out one thing. Uh, apart from IC, right, another big use I, I can see is that in optics, uh, uh, nowadays people are very interested in, uh, for example, many companies in AR display, augmented reality displays, and that glass, basically, the, the uh, if you look into the basic principle, it's actually using these nanoscale gradings, sub wavelength gradings to scatter light, right? To scatter the image into your eye. To make that nano imprint by now, I believe is still the most proper way of uh, proper manufacturing technique. Yeah, many companies are doing that. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, the next question is, uh, great technology. <clears throat> I'm from an IC foundry in the mainland, can you please comment on the application of nano imprinting technology in future directions? Actually, you yeah, just kind of covered that uh, with the last one, I suppose. Yeah, let's move on to the, the final question then. Uh, you mentioned carbon nanotube mm -hmm. forests. In MEMS fabrication, we have black silicon during the dry reactive etching process named silicon grass. Can it also be used for devices? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I've seen the, the black silicon myself, actually it's sometimes unsuccessful uh, etching, right? It's pretty black. Uh, it uh, functions similarly, you know, as a graded index. Um, you can, uh, it, it's pretty black, but, uh, but I think it's not as black of carbon nanotube. But in terms of the, the absorption property, maybe it's not as broadband as, the, um, uh, as carbon nanotube. Carbon nanotube is a conducting uh, material. Silicon has a band gap, mm -hmm. right? If you go below the uh, band gap, let's say if you get into infrared, it's, it's actually very totally transparent. So it depends on the application. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, there was some work in the, like photo detectors is try to make use of these uh, silicon uh, sort of grass to, to enhance the, the uh, absorption, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, with that, you know, uh, if this, if uh, we were able to be together I would uh, walk across the stage. I would thank you for circling all the ACS Nano uh, papers and ask you to have even more circles in your next talk. Uh, so do keep sending us your, your top work. And uh, thank you for this really wonderful uh, introduction to the, to the field and your work. 
and where it's going. Uh, I'll point out that uh, next week we'll be focusing on flexible electronics and we'll also announce the speakers for our next um, uh, set of talks after that. Uh, so uh, welcome to the growing community for the ICANX talks. We look forward to seeing you all uh, next week uh, before we celebrate the uh, new year. And uh, let me thank Alice Zhang for uh, putting these together and uh, Jagadish for now uh, uh, co-organizing with us. Thanks very much. Thank you.